Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started and I'll just, as people come in, we'll let them in. First off, I wanted to say, hi everyone. My name is Chris Johnston and I'm a board member with the Friends of Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge. We are a 501c3 nonprofit, which was established in 1997. And we support Ohio's only national wildlife refuge complex with things like youth development, public use projects, and most recently land acquisition and restoration. We are located along the southern shore of Lake Erie near Oak Harbor in some of the most critical wetland habitats in the world. If you are interested in learning more about us and what we do, I will add a link to the chat in just a minute. This link will point you in the right direction to become a member, make a tax deductible donation to support our work, or even to shop our online nature store. In fact, watch that chat throughout the presentation because a couple of links will be going in from Amy and I. Today, I am joined by our presenter, Amy Stone of the OSU Extension Office of Lucas County, where she is an educator. Amy holds several degrees and she has gracious, graciously joined us today to share her program, Calling All Birders, how you can monitor and report invasive species while birding, birding with us. Before we begin, um, since this is a small group, please feel free if you have a question, Go ahead and ask it or drop it in the chat box. We also will have time for questions and answers at the end of the program. Just a reminder, we are recording the program and we will send it to the registered attendees in case you had to miss part of it or you just wanna rewatch it. At this time, I will now turn it over to Amy to get started. And thank you so much, Amy. You're welcome. Thanks for the intro, Chris. I uh, just wanted to kind of elaborate just a little bit. Um, I tell folks I have really the best job in the whole world. Um, I get paid to learn and then share that knowledge with others in extension. And as so I'm an agriculture and natural resources educator. So that's my specialization um, or that's my program area uh, with the university. But we also have three additional program areas, um, community development, our 4-H youth development and family consumer sciences. And no matter what county you're calling from in Ohio or actually beyond Ohio's borders, you really should make that connection with your land grant university and your local extension office. There's just a, a plethora of resources that are available. Um, we kind of joke that we're a best kept secret and we try our best to get the word out to, to make sure that people know extension and the resources that are available. Um, today, though, I uh, was asked to talk about invasive species, but specifically looking at how to monitor and report. Um, you know, we're seeing an increase of invasive species on the radar, and what we want to do is really try to engage people because we know it's the public that will find these new invasives or um, the hitchhikers that kind of jump from that leading edge. And so we're just want to engage people and what a great group of people to engage, but birders, they're outside um, with, you know, high powered um, cameras or um, binoculars. And so while they're looking for birds, they may um, kind of pick up and look for something else along the way. And so it's your love for birding that we really have decided that this is a key group that we really want to make sure that we're communicating with and engaging with. Um, and just like I said, you love the outdoors and that's where these invasive species are coming. And so it's not all that you have to give up on the birds because that's not it at all. Please enjoy the outdoors, enjoy the birds. But if you ever see anything that looks unusual or strange or you haven't noticed it before, you're seeing a big population, make sure that you let somebody know. Yeah, and so we want you to be part of um, this monitoring and this ongoing work that we're doing in the world of invasive species. And so I kind of joke around that we're kind of recruiting people for this invasive species army um, and not to spread the species, but to spread the word and that monitoring and detection. And so today I want to hopefully raise awareness, uh, get people thinking that, oh man, that's pretty easy. I can do that while I'm out birding. Um, how you can get involved specifically, and then of course, spread the word to others. And we really wanna get the word out. 
So we're gonna just lay kind of some basic groundwork in the beginning, and then I'm gonna use some examples of what to look for and then how to report it at the end of the presentation. You know, you hear the word native and non-native. Um, you know, native means that it has been in the location for a very long time. The opposite, of course, would be non-native. So something that was introduced. And I think it's important to note that um, even though something is non-native or it's been introduced to our environment, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad. Those non-natives that are bad, um, we term them invasive. And so we'll talk a little bit about what the true definition of an invasive is, but it's, un, it's, it's causing harm to something else in the environment, whether that's human health, um, the, it's out competing other species, whether that's an insect or a plant. Um, and that's kind of that term invasive. As I said, not everything that's non or that's yeah non-native is bad. And so we've got the European honeybee that obviously if you're a beekeeper or you like honey, um, and of course the whole world of pollination and these bees um, are very important. And then many or, or some of you out in the audience may um, have this reaction to this plant. Um, and, you know, some people may curse that plant and think that it's the worst plant in the world. So this poison ivy, um, although can be harmful to some, it is native. And so, you know, we just have to kind of keep that in mind when we talk about this, the species that are out in our environment. I always pose a question, so what do you think? Do invasive species increase or decrease biodiversity? And often if we're face-to-face, -face, we get some good discussion going. And I'm here to say that really both answers are correct. Um, of course, when that non-native species is introduced to an area, it increases biodiversity, right? We have a new species but ultimately because of its aggressiveness and its ability to outcompete everything else, it decreases biodiversity and that's what's problematic. So what is an invasive species by definition? So it's an organism. So, I mean, it can be a lot of different things, but growing or living outside its, of its native or natural range. And it's often human introduced, either on purpose or potentially by accident. Invasive species are also species that spread rapidly into unwanted areas. So we often think of this with native plant systems and it's to the detriment of other native species, which is problematic. You've probably heard a lot about invasive species in recent years. Um, I mean, it seems to be there's always something on the radar, um, but realize that it is a two-way street. And so we're not here in the United States just on the receiving end. Unfortunately, we have sent things to other countries and this fall webworm, which is one of our natives, is a good example of that. So here in the, the uh, Ohio, the United States, this insect is really not a big deal. We see populations build and then they crash and they really don't cause any undue harm to the health of the host plant. But this insect unfortunately made its way to China. The common name for this insect in China is the American white moth. Um, it's non-native and it's invasive and it's very problematic. In fact, scientists from China have come over to the United States to look for parasitoids and predators and other biological control measures that they could collect here in the United States and take them back to China where they, with studies, could reintroduce them in hopes of trying to manage this pest with some biological controls because it's such an issue. Now the next part of the presentation, I'm just gonna highlight um, six different species of concern. Now, this doesn't mean that these are the only species that we want you looking for, but I hope that it gives you a taste of, of what um, things that you could be looking for. And so let's start out. So we've got the gypsy moth. I call this the oldie on the move. Um, this insect has been in the United States since the 1800s. 
Uh, but it's one that, you know, is continuing to move westward and we see populations build and crash and then build back up. The emerald ash borer, of course, um, here in Ohio, you know, it's moved through pretty rapidly. Um, it's up to 35 states that have an infestation, but we'll talk just briefly about that one. I call the Asian longhorn beetle an eradication poster child. And so this is really a success story. This is an insect that was introduced to the United States. And um, because of folks like you um, alerting USDA and your local Department of Agriculture that, hey, we're seeing something that looks kind of funny um, or suspect, um, we were able to, and we meaning a whole group of people, both at the federal, state, and local levels, um, are able to eradicate and eliminate populations, which is good news. We're going to talk a little bit about the spotted lanternfly, and this one is on the radar. Um, it is um, or has been detected in Jefferson County, Ohio for the first time last year, um, and, but it's one that we definitely want to make sure that everybody knows what this insect is and what to look for if you're out and about. And then kind of in collaboration with spotted lanternfly, I've got a couple plants and the first is Alanthus or Tree of Heaven. So it's a weed tree that is actually turned host and is a preferred host for spotted lanternfly. So you can actually kind of knock out two invasive species um, when you're looking for Alanthus and then of course spotted lanternfly. And finally, we'll end up with kudzu, uh, a plant that ate the south and is munching its way north. And so we have populations of kudzu um, in Ohio. And so we just want to make sure where we know where those populations are and we can turn to folks like you to kind of keep us updated on what you're seeing. All right, so we're going to start out with gypsy moth. Um, and you may know a lot about gypsy moth. Uh, this is a defoliator. So it will eat the leaves off of trees and it can do it pretty quickly. And repeat... Um, years of gypsy moth defoliation can cause plants to be very stressful. They can go into decline and, and often we can see plants die after this repeat um, infestation. And this is the caterpillar. There's really nothing else like it um, as it gets fully grown in this stage. You'll notice there's pairs of blue and red dots. Um, and of course they are a little bit hairy. This insect though hatches in the early spring when red bud is blooming. And so that's a kind of a phenology plant indicator that you might be interested in learning more about that. So whenever I see red buds in the spring, I know that if gypsy moth caterpillars are present, they're gonna start to hatch. They're very small, black, indescript, um, but they're gonna find that plant to start feeding and that defoliation is gonna um, began to occur even when they're very small. Those caterpillars grow like that previous picture that I showed and then they pupate. Um, so this is kind of that stage where they're going from the larval stage to that adult stage. And what we see here are two adults. The male is in the, the uh, forefront, um, kind of brown colored, if you look closely at the antenna, they almost look like feathers and they're used for receptors um, because she gives off a pheromone or a scent that is attractive. And so he hones in on those scents and that takes him to the female that you can see here that's a bit larger and white in color. The female as shown here is actually laying her egg mass, which can consist of 50 to 500 eggs, depending on the circumstances, but she really doesn't fly. Um, and so it really does kind of hasten or slow the spread because this stage of the adult at least doesn't fly. So the female or the male has to kind of fly to her um, to mate and then she'll lay eggs kind of in that same general location. And you can have multiple egg masses. So, you know, if you're out in the winter and you look up at a tree and you notice, you know, these brown kind of quarter size, but a little bit more long than round um, egg masses, you know, 
grab a photo if you can um, and let somebody know because that's an indication that the population is building and we're gonna see caterpillars next spring. Next, I want to talk uh, just briefly on emerald ash borer because this is a pest that uh, we've been dealing with for a long time. Um, and it kind of is sad that we see that huge loss of a lot of ash trees in our environment or in our communities. Uh, this is a map just to kind of give you a heads up on how widespread this insect is. And so the other thing I know about birders is that they travel um, to see birds, right? And so this is something just to keep in mind, one, to make sure that you're not spreading invasive species as you go visit other parts of the country, uh, but two, to kind of find out what are the invasives that are in those areas so you don't bring something back. Um, or there's been plenty of examples of people from the emerald ash borer kind of core zone where it's been for a long time visit family and friends in other parts of the state, and they're the ones that have been able to detect emerald ash borer. So they see that declining ash tree where they visit and say, you know what, somebody needs to check into that because I think you have emerald ash borer. The next insect I want to talk about is the Asian longhorn beetle. Uh, this is a big one. Um, and this, remember, is what I've kind of referred to as the poster child. So it is in the family of the Cerambicid beetles. So we do have some native longhorn beetles, um, and obviously they have na are named because of those long antenna. But you'll notice some people call this the starry night beetle, uh, black with white spots of different size and kind of um, really not that symmetrical. You'll notice at the base of the antenna and also on its six legs, there's kind of a bluish cast to them also, which are really good identifiable characteristics. Now, if you have ever seen or heard Joe Boggs talk, Joe is one of our fabulous entomologists, uh, but he is also, um, he loves to uh, really capture people's attention. And so he does some Photoshop work um, Asian longhorn beetle is a big beetle, it truly is. It's not quite this big. Um, this is a picture of Eric Draper up in um, Geauga County. Um, and so you can see that male beetle up there. And then of course, Joe did some additional Photoshop work here. Uh, the females truly are um, larger than the males, but not quite that large. So hopefully I got a smile out of some folks there. Uh, but one thing you're going to be looking for, um, especially up in the tree canopy, are these holes. And there's actually two different types of holes that you'll see. The first is the pits where she's actually laying eggs. And so it's almost more like a divot. So she chews out the bark and lays individual eggs. The other hole that you may see is this perfectly round hole that you could shove a number two pencil in. And that's the hole that the beetle emerges from after the larvae have fed on the inside of the tree. And so you can see there's multiple, um, let me pull this here. So you got a perfectly round exit hole here, here, and here. Yep. And there's one over here that's starting to heal. But then you've got some activity down here that are kind of the remnants of the activity of where she was actually chewing in. Just wanna throw up um, this picture here of the life cycle of the insect. And so it too overwinters, um, the same as emerald ash borer, we really didn't get into to that, um, but in the larval stage underneath the bark, um, in the it, early spring, it pupates. So there's no pupil casing, there's nothing um, around the pupa, but it's inside the tree. So the only time you would see that is if you would cut a tree down and kind of slice it in half. But from that pupa, the adult beetles emerge, which will be coming up here shortly during the summer. They find a mate and lay eggs on the outside in that divot, and then the whole cycle begins. It is important there's one generation per year and the tree killing phase of this insect particularly is the larvae that feed underneath the bark. And so every stage except the adults can um, survive the, the winter temperatures. And so once we have 
those freezing temperatures in the fall, the adult beetles will be gone. This is another invasive species that's native to Eastern Asia, specifically um, China and the Koreas. The good news is, and actually uh, we've got one additional find um, since this, this map is up here on the screen, uh, there is an infestation in South Carolina. But you'll notice in comparison to the emerald ash borer map that had lots of red dots all over the place, these are very few and far between, which is good news, right? So the goal here in the United States, in North America, is to eradicate and eliminate Asian longhorn beetle from North America. And the success story that, was, um, that happened early on was in Chicago or the Chicago, greater Chicago area. And you can see where they had multiple infestations. Uh, they did a lot of tree removal work. Um, they did some pesticides as kind of the insurance policy. Uh, but the good news is even after it had spread out just a little bit, all of those sites were eradicated and the beetle was eliminated. This is a map of Ohio. And so we do have a small infestation in Claremont County. Now I say small infestation because if you look at the whole state, it's rather, rather small and limited. But of course, if you're living in that area and it includes your property, it is nothing but small and it may feel overwhelming and, and very large. Um, and there's so many trees that have been lost to these eradication efforts. But you can see here, and it's kind of, it blends in a little bit, but we have a large red area. I'll take my pointer and kind of show you there. There's also these two red areas here. So the insect um, are, got moved out from the original site, uh, but homeowners, like yourself, um, alerted the authorities that said, hey, I think we have Asian longhorn beetle outside of that original core area. The good news is, is that those two smaller areas, the insect has already been eradicated and eliminated, and they're focusing again back on that larger core area where the initial um, detection was found. You may think, well, gosh, why all this effort on that one beetle? Well, it's because of the host trees that this insect likes. So it loves maples. It's a very good host, but it also likes, of course, chestnuts and buckeyes, elms and willows. And then there's another list that they can um, infest. And if you just look at that list for one second, um, there's probably not many people that are on the call or watching this video that at least don't have one of those species in their own landscape um, or maybe as a street tree in front of their house. And so it has a very wide host range, which can be very detrimental if we lose all those species of trees. So the other one that I want to talk about today is the spotted lanternfly. Um, and at the end of the session, I'm going to put up a link. Um, we have some grant dollars to do some spotted lanternfly outreach and education. And as part of that, uh, we do some survey work to make sure that people are getting the message about spotted lanternfly. So there will be a link that you can click on if you'd like to take a survey just to kind of judge your pre and post knowledge of, of spotted lanternfly. And that would be helpful for me. And I would appreciate that. But let's talk about spotted lanternfly. So another invasive species on the radar, something that we want you to be looking for. This one is has a pretty wide host range, but again, from Asia. Although in 2006, it was discovered in Korea outside of the native range. So in Korea, it was considered non-native and invasive. They've done a lot of research in that area. In 2014, it was discovered for the first time in North America in Pennsylvania, almost kind of on the other side of Pennsylvania by Philadelphia. It was Berks County was the original find. And so quite a ways from Ohio, but something again that we were on the alert of and kind of watching that develop. It unfortunately has continued to spread both naturally, so on its own, 
and then of, um, through some artificial movement. And that's what we're really kind of concerned about because it can jump great distances and populations begin to build. And so we hope that you can help us find those artificial movements, those sparks or hot spots. So in 2020, um, it was discovered in Ohio for the first time as a reproducing population in Jefferson County. So very close to the Pennsylvania line near uh, West Virginia. I do just want to kind of take you just a little bit of a historical perspective to show you how fast some of these invasive species can um, expand or travel. And so this was three years into the original infestation. And so the original infestation is the red dot, but the counties surrounding that red dot all had known populations of spotted lanternfly. This is five years into the infestation. Again, here's that original Berks County. Oops, there we go. Berks County right here in the center. But you can see that again, it's expanding out. We see a population here in Virginia. The yellow um, are finds of maybe a dead adult. So maybe it hitchhiked on a vehicle, but once it got to its got to the destination, it wasn't alive or wasn't able to reproduce. But of course, they watch those areas pretty closely. Here we see it kind of growing a little bit. I know my maps got smaller because we have additional states. Um, and then here, they actually remove the gold counties and replace them with a purple dot. Um, and it's kind of hard to see, but if you, if we could blow up that map and really get into it, you would see that there's um, a lot of purple dots here in New York. But what I wanted to point out is the two counties here in Pennsylvania and then the one in Ohio. And this was so February of 2021. So just over nearly a year and a half ago. This is March of this year. And you can see, look at this little pathway here that goes from the original infestation all the way over here. And so this is kind of concerning. This is transportation hubs or routes. And that's really what we need to be concerned about. So let's talk a little bit more about the insect. The spotted lantern fly is really not a fly at all. It's actually a plant hopper. And plant hoppers, as you'll see here, will pierce in with this sucking mouth part, so almost like a syringe, into the twigs and branches and kind of suck out that sap. And so spotted lanternfly is a plant hopper, even though it has a fly in its name. And we'll talk about how, maybe how it got its name in just a, a second. The spotted lanternfly has one generation per year. It overwinters as eggs. And then right now, We've had hatch um, in areas where the population is known, and they look like these little black and white nymphs. Um, they can be, some people have gotten them confused or think they're almost like tick-like, so pretty small. Um, so it would really take a good eye to see those. Um, they go through four stages. So stage one, two, and three, they remain black with white spots. But in this fourth instar, they actually have some red coloring in their bodies. And it's at that stage, um, then they're gonna go from the nymph, the immature, to the mature adult. And so let's take a look at some real pictures of adults. And so some people say, well, my gosh, it almost, they almost should be the spotted lantern moth because they look more moth-like than fly. Um, but again, they're that plant hopper, so that group of insects, but actually very attractive, very beautiful. The adults um, have really, uh, in, you know, the, the overwings that, you know, the top wings that are the spots and the little lines that are, are black are beautiful. But underneath there, you can see that bright red and actually the abdomen, um, especially if it's a female and has eggs in it, kind of gets larger and it can be a bright yellow in color. They do kind of have this flashy display when they're disturbed. So they're not, um, you know, they don't zoom off here or there. They're kind of clunky when they, they fly. Uh, they don't fly great distances, but they can give this display. And it actually is to kind of, you know, maybe scare some predators away. Hey, I've got these bright colors. You need to stay away. 
And you can see here, again, that moth-like appearance almost. But if you look kind of head on to this insect, it holds its wings in a tent shape or kind of like a, a triangle. This is a female that was found in Jefferson County. Um, the adults are about an inch long and a half inch wide. And so, you know, they're, they're pretty good size, but yet when you see sometimes, you know, them on billboards or videos, or I'm giving you this presentation today, you may imagine something really large. Um, but, you know, they're, they're not too big, but obvious, they're more obvious as adults than they are at nymphs. The adults will appear later in the summer, and that typically is when we see new populations um, are found or, or people discover them because that's really the stage of the insect that most people are drawn to. This, insect, or this photo, although kind of small, um, you know, I said that they're beautiful, they stand out. There are 13 adults, and so they can sometimes blend or camouflage themselves on the barks of trees. So you still really have to have a good eye and be watching for that. Right here, we got a photo of two of them mating, and then the females starting to lay eggs. And so the eggs are laid together, almost in rows, or some people have described it as chains. Uh, there can be 30 to 50 eggs in a mass. And then what she does is once the eggs are laid, she covers them with a waxy coating. And when it's fresh, those really stand out. But as the season progresses, they kind of age and crack. And I'll show you that in just a second. You'll notice in that egg mass stage, it's a little bit darker, uh, but you'll see that the eggs, some of them didn't get covered up and are more exposed. Here's just a few photos. They can really blend in. Um, so you do have to have a kind of a keen eye and that's when binoculars come in really handy. Note that they don't have to be laid on trees. These egg masses actually can be laid on any flat surface. And you can see on this barrel, multiple egg masses at the bottom of that barrel. I talked to you a little bit about the aging process of the eggs and how they crack. They almost look more like concrete. And so here's the same egg mass over a period of time and how it changes as the season progresses. We talked about the nymphs. And so here's just more kind of some up close photos. Um, and you can see that black and white with the first, second and third instar with the red in the fourth instar. The one thing I did want to mention is they also do have a very broad host range, especially as nymphs. So similar to Asian longhorn beetle with a broad host range, it's actually even more broad than that. But the adults prefer and really like Tree of Heaven, another non-native invasive. They will also feed on grapes, which is problematic, especially if you have grapes in your own backyard, um, if you're a vineyard manager or grower. Um, and then of course, if you like wine or grape juice, it's a concern. They can be a nuisance. Um, and so they're not outright killers is one good thing about spotted lanternfly. This plant hopper though, the populations can build pretty rapidly. And so some people may not wanna be outside when there's these hundreds and thousands of adults that are all over the place. And we know that as they pierce into the, the stems and the, the, the trunk of plants, um, what comes out the other end is honeydew, which then can be covered up with this black sooty mold. And so it can become pretty messy when populations build. Here's some photos um, on grapes and you'll notice the spotted lantern flies are present only on the twigs and branches. They're not on the leaves. They don't feed on leaves. They don't feed on the fruit. They're going directly into those stems and branches. Good news is that there are some insecticides that are pretty um, good as far as management. And so you can see some dead spotted lanternfly adults in this vineyard. Um, 
but it's repeat applications and so higher costs to make sure that you get the coverage that you need to protect the plants. They also will feed on apples and other fruits. And so again, they don't spend a lot of time on apples, but imagine you taking your family out to an orchard, um, you know, to harvest your own apples or for a tour, and you come across, you know, these hundreds and thousands of spotted lanternfly. And so they just are a pop, can be a population um, nightmare. There's also a concern um, that the honey that is being produced in areas where spotted lanternfly is has a very distinct taste. And some people have described it as almost smoky. And so they're trying to learn more about what's happening there um, and what that cause is. Just a couple of things with spotted lanternfly, we have to think about transportation. And so this insect is a hitchhiker. So when we ever, when we visit places that have spotted lanternfly, we wanna make sure that we're not bringing it back or at some point, if spotted lanternfly is in your community and you travel outside of that community, you wanna make sure your vehicle is pest free as well as everything else that you have so you're not introducing it somewhere else. I know that was a quick crash course on spotted lanternfly, but I, there are a couple of resources that I wanna mention. One is, they're actually both out of Virginia. Uh, this is lookalikes. And so you may think, gosh, there's really nothing that looks like spotted lanternfly. It looks pretty different. But when you're out in the field and you see something and you don't have that comparison, you might think, oh, I don't know. This is a great sheet. But you know what? If you see something that you even have the smallest inkling that you think it might be spotted lanternfly, make the report and let somebody else make that decision if it is or not. Also, there's one that... Um, identifies different egg masses that people may or may not get confused with spotted lanternfly. All right, so let's see, we're doing good on time. We've got two more to cover and then we're gonna talk about the app that you can report all of these invasive species on. I wanted to include Alanthus simply because Alanthus is a preferential host for spotted lanternfly. This is a non-native tree that comes into an area and can spread pretty rapidly, both by seed production and through suckers or through the root system. They have very stout stems. Um, so some people say that they almost look sumac-like, but you'll notice the bud sits right down in that leaf scar. It is a compound leaf. So a leaf, one leaf can be about three feet in length, but each leaflet as shown here, have these two little glands. So if you ever come up to a plant and think, gosh, is it sumac? Is it tree of heaven? I just don't know. If you reach up and touch the base of the leaflet, if it is tree of heaven, it will have these two little glands. Now, sometimes they're not as obvious. So look at this photo. Oops. So the two little glands are right here. This one isn't as obvious. It actually has four, one, two, three, four but you can definitely feel that with your finger. It's just a raised bump. The other photos that I have on here, uh, this is a female in flower, and then the, the smoother bark of the, the tree itself. And yes, so there's female trees and male trees. Uh, the female trees are very prolific. They can produce up to or over 300,000 seeds per year. So if you're trying to manage for this, we recommend that you try to eliminate the females first, just because they are can be so prolific and reproduce. They are a persistent re-sprouter. So if you just cut it back, you'll probably have 20 more trees the next year. So you really have to cut and treat that stump. They can produce an allelopathic compound where other plants don't grow in the vicinity, um, kind of like a black walnut. Um, and they will grow in a wide variety of conditions. Uh, we see them a lot on public right-of-ways, but I've seen them grow between the, a brick building and a sidewalk where there is no exposed soil. So they are just really tough plants. The last one on our list is kudzu. Um, and I just mentioned this because it's here in Ohio and we really need to get a better hand on where actually it is. And so we've got 
Uh, a leaf is actually its compound. So these three leaflets are one leaf. I say it looks kind of like poison ivy, but on steroids, it's pretty big. Um, and a beautiful flower, it has kind of a great scent to them. Um, I don't really try to give it too much um, kudos because we, we don't want it, we want to eliminate it. Here are a couple of photos. So you can see this individual here standing amongst the kudzu and then here trying to treat some kudzu uh, with a backpack sprayer. Um, it was introduced on purpose as a forage plant in the 1800s. Um, and it was widely planted uh, for soil erosion control. Well, sure, it's so aggressive that soil isn't gonna move once, once kudzu um, is established. It was also widely uh, planted by the Conservation Corps, but then in 1953, it was um, removed um, as a, a plant that should be planted in the environment. So here's just another photo of the leaf itself. Uh, this is an area in Cleveland that I visited that had um, an infestation of, of kudzu, and it had been growing for quite a while. You can see it loves to grow up telephone poles, utility poles, and just will take over. I mean, it's just a sea of kudzu. We thought early on that the plant, our season might not be long enough. And so in the South, it has a very long season, right? So it can produce leaves, it can flower, it can set seed. And so the original thought was, well, maybe in Ohio, the plant will reproduce like a perennial and get cut back or, you know, die back to the ground each year, uh, which is still problematic. Uh, but we didn't think it would flower and set seed. And unfortunately, uh, this is another photo of Cleveland uh, where we had successful seed production. So in addition to it, you know, overwintering as the plant itself, we now have a seed source that can also be spread. So that's kind of just gives you the, just a, a taste of some plants and insects to be on the lookout for. If you're still not sold, Amy, these invasive species, I'm just not sure about. I'm gonna share one more detail with you. Um, there has been some research done and it's continuing that cardinals um, are actually declining in areas where we have the invasive honeysuckle. And so what's happening is cardinals are eating the red berries of honeysuckle and it's actually increasing the redness of the feathers. And so maybe you had a bird that really wasn't superior um, and maybe would not have been chosen for a mate because, you know, that color is just not right. Um, but now they're eating the honeysuckle and they're having this kind of false red. And so it ultimately is um, one of the reasons why that population may be declining in certain areas. So this is just an example of how invasives really do impact birders um, or birds and birders should be um, you know, concerned about that and how they can help by monitoring for invasive species. So what do you do? You're, you're learning about these invasives, you're out in the field, you see something that you think, gosh, that just doesn't look right. You can download an app for free called the Great Lakes Early Detection Network app. And just a little history about this app. So when we found Asian longhorn beetle, uh, we thought, well, we need to have an app so people could report, you know, suspect finds of Asian longhorn beetle. And as we sat around the table, we thought, you know what? We don't want people just looking for Asian longhorn beetle. What about all the other invasives? So we started working with Bugwood and uh, Eugene Bragg, Kathy Smith, Marnie Titchell, and myself kind of came together and have kind of helped I don't wanna say develop because it was already there, but brought Ohio to the table so we can um, really promote and be part of this Great Lakes Early Detection Network. And so it's run out of the University of Georgia with their Invasive Species and Ecosystem Health Program. There's also another great resource called Bugwood. Um, so there's lots of photos and good information about, about natives and non-natives if you're into that on Bugwood site. But back to the Gleddon that we like to call it, you can actually go through and choose. 
So there are lots of different things that we want you to be looking for, but you can also kind of shorten that up and make your own watch list. So you don't have to scroll through everything each time, but hey, these are the species that I'm going to look for. And you can see we've got, you know, the, the, the plants here, um, insects, diseases, fish, mammals, we, we've got it all. So this is a pretty inclusive um, app. So if you choose trees, what you'll see is a tree list. Um, and this list is from multiple states. So whatever state has provided this list, it's added in here. So even though it might not be invasive in Ohio, Obviously, if it's invasive somewhere else, we need to be on the lookout for it. You can use this really for educational purposes. There's images, there's infos, there's maps. You can make your report. Um, you can compare it to what you're seeing out in the field. So here are just some images and you obviously saw a couple of those images in my presentation earlier. Um, there's also a description of the species that you're looking at. And then if you have a feeling that, yep, this is what I'm seeing, <coughs> you go to this EDD maps, which is kind of cool because multiple states are using this and the data can be shared. And so this is kind of just the next level. So you actually have to have a username and password with this second level. You log in and you can make your report. So, yep, I'm seeing Tree of Heaven. You can document is the infestation in acres? Is it square feet? Is it one plant? You can include any notes. We want you to take a photo of what you're seeing because we like to photo document. Um, we're not just going to take people's word for it. Uh, we want to have that, that photo to make sure that, yep, that, that's what you're seeing. That's what you've reported. You hit save and then it goes into what we call the queue. And so one of the things early on, people said, gosh, it's taking up a lot of data, especially if you're out in the field. Um, so right now, what happens is those reports go into a queue. And then once you get to an area that you have Wi-Fi or more reliable internet, you just hit um, report. And then all those reports that are stacked up go in at once. And so if we then say, yep, that's what it is, um, it becomes a red dot on the map. The, um, the app really helps us determine when populations go up and down. So gypsy moth is a good example of that. It also helps us when the pest is on that leading edge. And so where, you know, where, where is that leading edge? Where are these new hot spots popping up? And then of course, like in the case of spotted lanternfly, um, it's gonna report new infestations maybe way beyond that leading edge because of artificial movement. Now the next slide that's up here, and I'm gonna just quick, let's see. Oh, I thought maybe I could do this. Let me, let me see here, get this survey copy. If you wanna take the survey, you can click on to this link that's in the chat box. And again, that's gonna be specific for the spotted lanternfly portion of the program. The other thing that I thought I had a slide, but I, I must have um, hit it, is the cool thing about the app is that you can report what you're seeing, but you can also report a negative report. And somebody may say, well, why would I wanna report a negative report, something that's not there? This is really important, especially in the, like the situation that we're currently in with spotted lanternfly. How many people are out there looking for it, but they're not seeing it, so we don't know. Um, and so what we're having people do is make the positive report of Alanthus or Tree of Heaven, and that goes through the system, but then they go out occasionally over the summer and visit that same tree the tree's still there. They don't need to make another report of that tree, but they're letting us know that, nope, there's no spotted lanternfly here. And so we can then say, okay, this area has been, people have been looking. Um, and so that helps us determine if we need to fill in voids where maybe there aren't any reports. And so that, 
that negative report is really um, kind of enhanced this tool and we've been really happy with that. Additionally, I know a lot of people are on iNaturalist. And so you could also, if you already have that app, um, you could make the report in that. Um, it's just gonna go through a couple of different ways to get to the final people that it know, you know, that need to know about that. Um, so I, I get it, there's a lot of apps out there and maybe you don't wanna overload your phone with them. Uh, I'm a big proponent of the Great Lakes Early Detection app, but what we really need to know is what you're seeing out in the field and that's so beneficial. So with that, I am gonna open it up for any questions or discussion. Um, if not, I, I hope I haven't overwhelmed you with kind of the bad news of invasive species but rather engage you to get excited about it and hopefully report what you're seeing. Amy, thank you so much for that presentation. I went and downloaded my app. You'll be so proud of me. And I was actually able to quickly look up Tree of Heaven just by typing the word heaven, which I thought that was really neat in the search bar. So kudos to the app. Um, I also wanted to mention that I dropped in the chat box a couple of more links. The first one being for are additional programs under Seek Refuge Day. So if you haven't registered for anything else that's coming up, you'll wanna take a look at that link. And then I also dropped in a special coupon code for our nature store that allows the attendees today to have a special coupon applied if they visit our nature store. So that being said, those are my two apps, and I are my two apps, what am I saying? My two links, and I would highly encourage you to take Amy's survey because it just seems to help her out and allows the, her great work to continue. The other thing I was going to say is I actually really learned a lot. So thank you so much. I did not know that poison ivy was invasive. I thought it was just irritating. So well, nice. so it's really not invasive because it's native. Oh, that's right. So, yeah. That so, again. Yep. So if you if it's something's native and even if it's a pain, you hate it, we want to term that as more aggressive. Okay. So for something to actually be invasive, it has to be non-native. Good to know. But it still is yeah. annoying. <laughs> it is. It is. Because when was I was young, I never got it. And I was like, I was just recently, within the last five years, I was at the OSU Mansfield campus and there was some poison ivy. I'm like, I, that's okay. I, you know, because people were pointing it out. I'm like, oh, I don't get it. Famous last words, right? Mm -hmm. I developed that um, and now I get it. I think you can get it more easily sometimes when you're older. I never had my first case of poison ivy till I was probably 40. And it was just one of those weird things. I was out digging in the yard and I pulled up what I thought were some weeds because I couldn't identify poison ivy. Let me tell you, I now know what it looks like. Um, sure. Went to some training, so I couldn't get to an urgent care or a physician and my whole arm just exploded and I was like, what is this? So again, thank you so much. Um, I also learned a lot about the lanternfly. Um, interesting to think how those things get to us and that they actually would follow a, a transportation way. So really neat to know. Um, anybody have any questions? I know we're so getting close to Luan time. So did type in. If, oh, thank you. Luan, type in the uh, Great Lakes Early Detection Network. She said that she had typed in Great Lakes Early Detection and it was actually a nautical chart. So yeah, Great Lakes Early Detection Network, Gledin, G-L-E-D-N. And I found it very easily in Google Play. Perfect. So I'm um, going to bet that you can asked, find it in iTunes. Yeah, I'm not okay, seeing her yeah. question, so she must have sent them to you. So go for okay. it. Uh, the other question was, is the Asian longhorn beetle also a defoliator? So the adults do need to feed um, before they reach maturity, but I would not call them a defoliator. They're not gonna eat every leaf off of a tree. You may see some feeding injury along the stems and even on like the petioles or even small twigs or branches, um, but the leaf canopy um, is not gonna be fed upon that it would be noticeable. So really good question. All right, and I just wanna put a plug out. So if you have other groups or organizations that you think could benefit 
from talks like this, uh, be sure to reach out to me. We can do something virtually or we can hopefully do some face-to-face -face training this year. And so the more opportunities we get out to speak to other groups, um, the better. There also too is some videos. So if you're kind of stumbling through the Great Lakes Early Detection Network app and think, oh, I just need a little bit more training um, on our Ohio Woodland Stewards Program, um, mm -hmm. or if you just put Ohio Gledden app training, uh, there's a, a video that takes you through the whole process of how to make reports. And so there's a lot of training materials if you need them. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I think we're at one o'clock. So I think we are. So we'll go our ahead and up. our time is up. But thank you again so much, Amy, and for everyone that joined us today. Um, and for those who will watch this later on. So everyone have a great day and thank you so much. Thanks, Chris. Bye now. Bye.